thing here. So it's, it's reasonable. It's a reasonable time to get up, but my husband's being really lazy. So yeah, <laughs> our son's school was actually canceled today because there was a COVID exposure. Um, so he's been actually in person, going to school in person um, with a lot of restrictions, but you know, today, unfortunately is canceled. So they're all sleeping in. <laughs> Right, let's get going then. So welcome everyone to Society Speakers Workshop Series. We've been doing these over the last few months, but we are Society Speakers, a, a Toastmasters club based in London. Nice to see so many of you here from, from other, other parts of the world today. And we normally meet for, for, to practice our public speaking on a, a, the first and third Wednesdays of the month. And we've been doing these things on the, the kind of the middle Wednesday, which is what we're doing tonight. So in terms of our club, we, we normally, as, as all Toastmaster clubs all over the, year, all over the world, we normally meet in a, in a room. This was, this was us until March of this year. We would you know, have fun meetings, do handstands, go to the pub afterwards. It was all great. Um, but since then, we've, we've managed to, we've, we've moved online exactly how we're doing it now. And it's just gone so well. And we've learned so many new skills and it'll be great to get back to the room and see each other again. But I think we'll probably carry on doing something like this as well because it, it has gone really well. That was our uh, Halloween uh, club meeting on the left and we don't normally look like that. So in terms of this evening, we've got three speakers, three, three workshops for, that are gonna be given for us. We've got Suzanne Poole, who is our very own member here at Society Speakers. She's going to be speaking to us about how to get big projects completed. Then Vicky Ferrer from California, or, or visiting us all the way from California anyway. And she'll be talking about characterization and improvisation. And then finally, we'll have Laura, Laura Reed, who is here from Hawaii. A big island, is it? Or would Big Island in Hawaii. And she's going to rock our virtual reality. So look forward to that at the end of the evening. Uh, I'll quickly. Okay, quickly just show you the agenda and then I'll pass you on to our host. So uh, yeah, Suzanne will speak, then we'll have a break, then Vicky, then a short break and then Laura, and then we'll close at the end of the evening. So I'm going to pass you over now. We'll, we'll try to have in the break, maybe a little bit of a chat with people and, and you know, you all get to say something. And there should be opportunities with questions and things happening during the workshops as well. But until that point, if everyone could just, in, unless you're speaking deliberately, could you just remember to stay on mute? And I'll pass you over now to our host for the evening, Nish. Hi everyone, I'm super excited to uh, be here this evening. I'm sure everyone's looking forward to a great uh, night of some really informative um, informative uh, workshops. Um, so a couple of things, just one thing that I wanted to um, put forward. So what I'd say, what, when we come to sort of the end of the, um, the workshops, we'll be asking for some uh, questions. Um, and if you would like to ask a question, please do put your hand up. So there's a little hands up um reaction i think in the in the um in the zoom reactions thing so if you can do that if you want to ask a question and then i'll scan through or yes a little like button there you go that's what dan's got on his um so if you do that as opposed to dropping anything in the chat it'll be great to hear from you as you as you kind of um as you ask your question and i can come to you and ask ask um what it is that you want to ask the the speaker um, cool. So without further ado, I'm going to um, start introducing our first speaker. So that's Suzanne. Uh, Suzanne Poole um, it, it coaches and provides consultancy for women business owners um, and entrepreneurs. And her talk tonight is how to get a big project completed. Uh, she has self-managed over the last uh, year or so, I guess, um, in, in within five months to actually complete a book. Uh, uh, the book is a secret code for women in the bedroom, the boardroom, and beyond. So um, I'm sure that there'll be some great insights that, she, that they will learn um, in this next um, workshop. So please, hands together for Suzanne Paul. Thanks, Nish. Hello, everybody. Lovely to see you all. And wow, how many, like, so many people from all around the world. Amazing. And Laura, thank you for getting up early this morning to be with us. That's amazing. Um, so hello, uh, for those of you that don't know me, and I think many of you do know me because I can see quite a few society speakers among us, but I'm Suzanne Paul. I am also the VP of, of PR 
for Society Speakers. And I've been a member of Society Speakers only since August, actually. So it's a real honor to be invited to speak tonight and present this workshop. And as Nish introduced me, my talk is about how to get big projects um, completed. And I like to term that, and I apologize for anyone that is vegan or veg vegetarian, but I once traveled in South, South Africa, and what they like to say about big projects is how to eat an elephant. So what we're going to talk about in this half an hour or 20 minutes, I'm gonna set my clock, and I'm only gonna speak for 20 minutes to give you a nice 10 minutes for questions at the end how to eat an elephant. And as Nish said, why am I qualified to bit by bit, Mal already has said, I will come to that in a moment. Why am I qualified to speak about this? Well, among many other projects, as Nish said, I have just recently, in fact, only three weeks ago, published my first book, Discipline, A Secret Code for Women, um, available on Amazon. And I just published it three weeks ago. But what if I told you that in the middle of May this year, so not even six months ago, or in fact, six months, like not even on the 25th of May, which is my birthday, um, that book did not have, it didn't exist. There was no plan to write a book. I didn't really think I was gonna write a book. Um, I had no idea that I was going to write a book. And yet here we are six months later and my book has been published for three weeks. How did that happen? That's what I'm going to speak about. So how to eat an elephant, bit by bit, as Mal already said. So big projects, they're daunting. Having the thought, I want to write a book. Well, I just was like always putting that thought to one side. I did say May 25th, that's right. Um, so always putting that thought to one side. Yeah, I've got a book in me, but I'm never going to get to that. It's too much. It's never going to happen. And yet it exists. And how did it happen? Well, here's my first tip for getting a project complete. One that daunts you. One that looks massive. It might be building your speaking career through Toastmasters. It might be moving house. It might be starting a business. It's really, it might be forming that relationship of your dreams. Actually, these tips apply to any aspect of life. What's the first tip? What do you want? Why do you want it? What vision are you creating for your life? So as Nish also told you, I'm an entrepreneur. I have my own business. I coach and mentor and consult with business, women business owners to help them have, develop their lives and grow their businesses. And that's what I'm about. I am about women, empowering women to really own all their spaces. So my big vision for my life is to serve and be of service to women. And that was the starting point for creating the book. And from there, you then break it down into the next part. And the key is all in the planning. So you break it down from the big vision into, okay, so that's what I'm about. What's my next message? Well, my next message to women is really that we can have it all. We deserve it all. Anything that we want for ourselves or our lives is possible, as long as we articulate it. So you write that down in your plan. What is it that I want? And be specific, be specific. This was one of the other things that I had already known, but I really got to see in the development and writing of my book. One of the most important aspects in the creation of the project was in the planning. And how did we create the plan? That is tip number two. We started with the bigger message. So I had my big vision, as I said, which is that I really wanted to deliver a message that was going to empower women and make a difference. And then I looked at what did I really want to say? And what I really wanted to say is that the key to success is being disciplined and being disciplined. So it's, allow, it's being a self-disciplined person and then allowing people to contribute to me. And that's what I mean about being disciplined and being disciplined with a wink. And in doing that, I became very clear what the message of the book on an overarching level was going to be. 
And if you apply that to a relationship, for example, you can create that in the aspect of how you want your relationship in life, your most intimate relationship in life to be. Or you can look at it from a broader perspective of how do you want to be in your relationships and create a vision for your relationships at a larger level. If you're creating a business, for example, you look at who are the people that you really want to serve, that you really want to make a difference to, and then you start to break it down. So, as I said, in the development of this book and the eating of the elephant called the book, what happened next? So from the larger, broader message of the book, I then broke it down on a mind map. And if any of you are creating projects, mind maps are a brilliant tool and you can ask me about them at the end. We created on a mind map, a 12 point plan of each chapter in the book. And each one of those chapters, each one of those branches became a chapter. And then this next part was the secret source in what became a really effortless process of having the book become reality. Each of those chapters became a map in itself. So the plan unfolded and unfolded and unfolded. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the key to eating an elephant. Breaking it down piece by piece. So if you think of a two pound steak, are you gonna shove that whole thing in your mouth? I'd love to be able to eat a two pound steak in one go, but I tell you, I would be sick as a dog immediately. How do you eat a two pound steak? One slice by single slice. And if you're French, very thin slices or Italian either. Um, but so you break it down and that's exactly how the book came to life. The book was broken down chapter by chapter and then it was broken down point by point and then it was broken down paragraph by paragraph and what happened next was a miracle and it is a miracle in creating your projects in reality because instead of sitting at my computer for hours and hours and hours at a time going I don't know what to write it kind of wrote itself and I was amazed. I started to write the book on the 3rd of June. I finished my first draft on the 30th of June. It's 35,000 words. I've never written 35,000 words of anything, let alone a book that I was willing to be published. I was shocked. But the trick had been in the meticulous planning. And I'll tell you this for nothing. I was sitting at my table drawing those mind maps and that was when I was sitting at the table going, I don't know what to create. I don't know what I want to say, but I put in the time and I put in the effort into creating the plans and the writing became effortless. So to summarize the first two or three points, the key to eating an elephant is really in the planning. But that wasn't the only thing because those plans could have lived in my head. And if they lived in my head, the book wouldn't be real. So the second key fundamental point that I'd like to impart to you today is the importance of actually having it be real. So while I was writing, while I was creating the book, as I said, I had mind maps and those mind maps weren't in my head. They were on paper. Forgive me. I actually did mean to be able to show them to you, but I forgot to go and get them. So I'm just going to I can go and get them afterwards. But they were colourful. They are colourful. So they were engaging to look at. They have pictures on them. They have scribbles on them. They don't they don't mean a lot to anybody else but me. And that's the key, that's the second key to having your projects be real in the world, is make it meaningful for you and in existence. It can be collages, it can be artwork. Artwork is a project in itself, that's 
inside of this whole conversation. But having those pictures be real for you makes the experience of creating whatever it is that you want in your life much more tangible. And tangibility, like being able, so we have this phenomenon in our, in our experience of we process things, we think just through our brains, but through our eyes, our ears, our noses, our sense of taste and our sense of touch. And the, the more impactful you can make the plan and the more alive you can make the plan for yourself in really having it be a tangible kinesthetic experience for you, the more vivid it becomes. So, it's all in the planning. No, because the planning is not the eating. So you've got these lovely plans and you've got this amazing project that you've really envisioned, but does it have, does it actually really live on the paper? No, because nobody is going to write it for you. Nobody is going to go out and meet the prospects and sell for you. Well, unless you hire them to do that. And if you want to find your partner and your soulmate, you have to go on a few dates. You don't necessarily have to kiss a few frogs, but you do have to go on a few dates. So what's the next part? This is where discipline comes into it. So if you set yourself a goal to write a book and you say, I'll have it done in two years, what do you think the chances of having your book complete within two years are? Probably not very good. It's too long a time span. Create some urgency for yourself. Make it important. Make it the most fundamental part of your life. So for the month of June, there was nothing else that mattered to me apart from writing my book. And I'll tell you, if you'd asked me on the 1st of June, did I think I'd be able to deliver a final draft by the end of June, I would have been, I, I can categorically say absolutely no way. But there was a moment after I'd done this extraordinary planning that I've shared with you, that I sat down to write and I couldn't believe it because in just four days, 10,000 words were on the page. Was I proud of the 10,000? I wasn't not proud of the 10,000 words. Did I think they were Shakespeare? Most definitely not. Shakespeare, I am sadly not. Not even, I'm definitely not George Eliot either. But did I think that I had somewhere to go? Yes. I was like, wow, this is actually happening. And from there, I reached out to the woman that I knew was going to partner with me to publish the book, because I did have a publisher already ready. And I said, hmm. I know there's a big book event in the middle of October. We're right at the beginning of June now. I've already written 10,000 words. I know that you want a book to be 40,000 words. How possible is it that I could publish my book for that event on the 14th of October? And she sat on the phone and she did some calculations. And she said, well, you need to deliver your final draft to me by the 31st of July. But if you do that, you can do it. I was like, six weeks, okay, here we go. And then I got my calculator out. And I thought, well, 40,000 words, I've written 10,000. It's taken me about four, four days to write 10,000 words. I've got, how long is it going to take me? How many words a day do I need to write to make that 40,000 target by the end of June? 2,000 words a day, five days a week. Okay. And that's when the discipline kicked in. I sat down every day at my desk and I didn't leave my desk until I'd written 2,000 words. And it, I kept doing it. And I was like, what's going on? This is not uncharacteristic, but surprising still, nevertheless. 2,000 words, 2,000 words, 2,000 words. And I was, gosh, 
how unbelievable there is a book forming. And here's the critical part of what happened. I set myself a deadline and I worked the plan backwards. So I knew that to be able to make that 14th of October deadline, I had clear idea of what needed to happen from my publisher, from the people that were supporting me with the plan. So I knew that I needed to get the first edit, the first draft of that book done by the end of June. Why? Because then I had to do a, an edit and that was gonna take me a week. Then I had to send it out to test readers who I like, you know, they're my friends, but they may not necessarily be as timely as I'd like them to be. I needed to get their feedback on the book and I needed time to incorporate it. And then I needed time to re-edit it and send it to my publisher by the end of July. And that is the third aspect of really delivering on a project, how to eat that elephant, being disciplined, knowing exactly where you are in the plan, having the clear plan laid out actually from the end to the beginning. I said, I went like that with my hand, but actually it's more like that. So from right to left, if you like. So from the end point of the 14th of October back to where I was at the beginning of June and being very clear what needed to happen by when to make sure that it could be delivered. So where in your life can you see that you have a goal, that you have a clear milestone endpoint for, and you can put a big plan into action and really get down and deep into that plan and unfold that plan from the end point back to now. I'm gonna, I've only got three and a half minutes left. I was confused by my watch, so forgive me for that. So in summary, what have I said so far? Have a big vision, be clear about who, who it is, what it is that you're creating, what you see as possible for yourself. From there, bring it back down, bring it down to earth, break it up into smaller parts. Find the core message, if it's a book, find the core part of what the project really is for you and then plan it out from there and then break each of those branches down further and further and further. Not just one level, not just two, but up to five. Really create a detailed plan. And then get to work. Crack that whip on yourself. I like that, I'm discipline, disciplinarian, I like cracking whips. We'll get to that another time. Crack the whip on yourself and then find out from the future, like from when you said you're gonna deliver this thing that you're creating for yourself and you know where you are now, what needs to happen at each stage to ensure that you meet your deadline. And what's the final point? Stick to the plan. That's the hardest part of the journey because it always goes off track. As I said, I had to send my book out to my friends to get their feedback. Some of them were a little bit later than others. Some of them gave me feedback that I was a little bit unhappy with and I needed to have conversations with them to find out what they were really saying to me. And then I had to get to work on re-editing. And that took a little bit longer than I planned. But he was the trick in that trade. I'd budgeted for extra time to allow for those breakdowns. And that is my final, and that's my secret golden nugget for you. Plan time to allow for the plan to go off track. Because with the greatest of respect, we are humans and things don't always go as we intended. And life's fun. Sometimes you'll get distracted and that's okay but then allow for that in the marshalling of your plan to bring it back to what it is that you want. And then ladies and gentlemen, that elephant has been eaten. And that, and now I open it to the floor for questions. Oh, I'm a little bit ahead of schedule, Nish, I think. I don't know, not, not, not sure, anyway. No, I think you're okay. a little bit ahead of question ahead of um, ahead of schedule. That's all good. Um, I have a question actually. Mm -hmm. How long did planning the book take? 
Um, so the planning of the book took a week, but in hours, I think it took about 12 hours. Okay. So it was a chunky process. It was, yeah. And actually there was more effort and energy consumed, well, inputted into the planning than there was in the actual writing was how it kind of felt to me in the end. And I would say that that is slightly counterintuitive because sometimes it feels like in a, when you have a big goal and you've got something in mind that you're up to accomplishing that you should spend more time in the doing of it than in the planning. Mm -hmm. And I find this really uncomfortable still, even though I know the proof is in the, in the pudding, that there is virtue in spending time in the planning. Mm -hmm. So. Um, also, we have a question from Elisa. Elisa, would you like to say your question? Sure thing. Thank you, Suzanne, so much for that excellent uh, speech that you're sharing with us tonight. I did have a question for you. Uh, what motivated you to write a book and how did you go about finding a publisher? That to me seems challenging. Thanks, Elisa. Yeah, so let me answer the second question first, if that's all right. I actually know my, I actually knew, wasn't kind of, I knew my publisher. I've known my publisher for about 10 years. Um, I happen to know that she's an expert in the field of public, of um, personal development books and business books. So I knew that she specializes in the kind of market that I wanted my book to be inside of. In terms of finding a publisher, I think there are a few ways to go about it. You can research. Getting a traditional publishing deal can be very difficult. They usually are reserved for people that have large followings, have a have a profile. So obviously Toastmasters is a way to develop that kind of profile, but they are, you know, the traditional advance and royalties model, which I can go into, that's a little bit complicated, but where you actually get paid to write a book, that tends to be because you've already got authority and expert status of a on almost a global level that enables a publisher to come towards you. The model that I've chosen is I have what's called a hybrid model. So I have a publisher and she is responsible there. The publishing house is responsible for getting my book into all the retail stores, but then I can also sell it myself. So I have lots of copies that I can also sell for myself. And I contributed to the creation, the publishing of the book. So financially. So that's that's that model. And then there is the self-publishing model. The self-publishing model is quite easy to do, but it's very hard to market. So I think that the, the hybrid model is a really good way of doing it. And the way to do that is through research. LinkedIn, there are publishers on LinkedIn um, and through, you know, and through networking like Toastmasters. Is, there are many people in Toastmasters that have had books published. So there's just conversations to have, really. It's all about people. Now, your second, your first question was what motivated me to write the book? Well, I have some, so I alluded to the fact that I, I like whipping. Um, I won't go into that too much. It's a little bit fruity, but what I can say is that I have a unique message for, for women about how possible it is to really create the lives that we want. And it comes back to discipline, really but it also, it's very much rooted inside of what I've been sharing with you all tonight. But I knew that there was something that I wanted to say, and I didn't just want to say it in a video on YouTube. I really wanted to create it in a permanent form. And that was what motivated me to write the book. I will say this, I'm not sure it would have happened if we hadn't been in lockdown, because I, before lockdown traveled an awful lot and I had wanted to write the book and it was never happening. And with lockdown, I found myself with sitting my ass on the floor, like sitting my ass down, not going anywhere. So I had a bit more space to commit to it. So that was helpful. Thank you. Lovely. Um, Mustafa, would you like to ask your question? Yes. Well? Shall I ask the question? Can you hear me? Yes, hello, Mustafa. Okay. Um, 
is about uh, where did the material come from? From your cell, from your head, or you had to do some uh, research to develop that's a kind great of a question. Evidence based. That's a great question. So my book is not my book is mostly my own thinking, Mustafa, but I've been I've been in around personal development and read a lot and studied a lot over about twenty years. So I've distilled a lot of information, but then there is some unique thinking that I have about it that relates to, and this is where this is where Elisa's question and your question kind of coincide I have some unique thinking about domination and submission as it goes which is why the whipping thing kind of ties in with it but that whole part about the energy understanding the energy of where it's important to really be the boss and like own the space and where taking a step back and being more kind of submissive and allowing and allowing receiving space where they intersect with each other and that was that's a lot of what that's a lot of what I've written about and that is much more there are lots of people that have written about that as well but they write about it in a certain slant and the way that I write about it is slightly different um and so so it was a hybrid it, it's a hybrid really it partly research over a long time and partly my own thinking about it thank, thank you. you great question all of the questions have been great so far thank you and there's also a question from it's Dan. <laughs> shall I ask you to say it or shall I say it, Dan? Oh, I, I can say it. Thank you. I was just wondering if there are any other areas of your life, Suzanne, where you implement these principles. And I, and I did stress that that maybe we stay away from the fruity ones. Yeah, I understand. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> um, yeah, so I particularly I find them useful really everywhere. So, you know, I like in terms of financial management in terms of business creation business growth particularly business growth I would say they're really and and I I say that in the matter of a purpose-driven business in particular so where the business is really developing from I I'm committed to women really experiencing all that life has to offer and my business sits inside of that so creating those kind of plant that planning around my business also really works. I would also say, so as you know, cause you've heard me talk about this a few times, I've recently over the last three years lost seven stone in weight and that came out of the same place. So I created a vision for myself around how I wanted to be physically and I articulated that and I built out a plan. And so, so really it can happen in any area of your life. Can we now hear about the fruity ones? Joke, I'm kidding. <laughs> we'll save that for when we can go to the pub, Nish. <laughs> next month, who knows? <laughs> um, Ram, do you want to um, go ahead with your question? Oh no, having done what you did. Okay, I'm, I'm failing in this particular task, sorry. Can I have a look at the chat, Nish? Yeah. Oh, right, cool, cool. So hang on. Having done what you did, um, which is fantastic, what would you do differently? Uh, so Ram, can I ask you, do you, can, in what area? Are you meaning specifically the book? Or like in any of the, the, the book specifically? Um, Well, one thing that I would have done differently is have my book fun already before I launched the book. So right now, the only way to buy the book is through Amazon. <laughs> and, um, and I do, I do, I ha am able to sell the book as well. So um, that is one thing that I would have been a bit more prepared for. Uh, I was prepared to write it. I wasn't necessarily vote so well able to sell it, but that's all right. It will come. Um, I, do you know what I, I'm actually that's a really hard question to answer because is it the most perfect piece of writing most definitely not um as I said I'm no George Eliot and I'm definitely no Shakespeare but I am quite proud of it and I had uh, no not that's not really because I you know I think it's been I accomplished what I sought to accomplish um it could have been a bit longer 
I might have taken a bit more time about writing it if I'd if I not put myself under so much pressure. But then that's a bit like a piece of string, because I think if I'd given myself longer, I could have given myself interminably longer and then I would never have a book. So I think there's beauty in being constrained. And that's one of the things that I write about in the book as part of the discipline is the, the, the containerizing of it in terms of it was time limited, really supported the delivery. And I would say that as an, as an addition in the, in the planning stage is that putting that time limit on and holding myself to that time limit did work for me. So I would say not really at this point, if that's okay. Um, there's one, I think we'll go for, this will probably be the second to last question, I'd say, if we've got one afterwards, but um, Laura, um, one, of our, one of our speakers for later on, um, do you want to ask your question? Sure, yeah, thank you so much for this. Um, it's, I have a goal of publishing my book by my birthday this year, March 3rd. And this is speaking so well to me. I love the idea of working backwards from your goal and making it bit by bit. And even just the details, like, okay, 2000 words a day, it's totally doable. Um, you alluded a bit to editing yourself, I thought, or, you know, doing a quick edit, you said. Yes. Um, I've always seen like the editing part of it as it's going to be this, this big thing. Um, like I have to find an editor, hire an editor, have them go through. So could you talk a little bit more about that and that process and whether you would recommend still doing that yourself or hiring someone for that? Um, so I think it depends, Laura. So the advice that I had, so by the way, what I didn't say is that the person who published my book, she's also a book coach and she was supporting me through the whole writing process, which was really, really, really helpful because she's super knowledgeable. But what I would say about the editing, so there was a proof read, reading stage at the end and that was done by the publishing team. And, and I'm really glad because they saw things that I didn't see. Um, and uh, But that was in, that was in proofreading. But in the editing, I actually personally think it's quite important to edit ourselves because it's our book. And the danger for me in someone editing my book was that they were going to come along and chop it to pieces, which like more power to them. That's completely valid and totally fine. But it was necessarily going to turn it away from being the, that I wanted to write into something that they were creating. And that wasn't OK for me. So so it was about me this so for me, it was very much a part of the process of this is my book. How do I want the finished product of this book to be? And it actually wasn't that difficult. Now, the writing, because the writing of it had been so quick, it did actually make the editing of it much easier because I did the writing. Then I went into the edit. So it was like boom, boom, boom. And there was virtue in that. Perhaps to answer Ran's question, maybe that's something that I could have done differently which has like given a bit more space to the editing time but for me it really worked because it was a personal book it was a it was a personal message I wanted to own that message and so it was really important for me to do the editing so that's what that's what I'd say about that thank you awesome thank you Um, so there's a question just to me, Nish. Shall I answer that? Thank you. So Joy asks, have I started my next writing project? Well, I'm a poster on Facebook. So I that's kind of a lot of my content generation that I'm doing at the moment. Um, I'm currently in the middle of a lockdown challenge aiming to run two miles a day every day that we're in the 28 days of lockdown. I have done it so far, in fact. I, I set myself a goal to do a mile a day from the 1st of July and Friday is day 150, come on. Um, so yes, um, so that's a lot of what I'm working on. And the other thing that I'm working on at the moment is I'm developing an online course. So I'm breaking the book down into a course that will be available online at the moment. So that's kind of my project. Plus I'm doing a master's, so I've got essays to write. And so I've got a few things to work on at the moment. Thank you. I think that's all. The, is that all the questions? Yes, I think that is all the questions. So, awesome. I, thank you so much for spending your time with me. That was fun. Thank you, Suzanne. I think, um, I don't know about anyone else, but I'm off to write my first book. 
after that, I reckon I can. I, I'll set myself a target to the end of lockdown. That's next Thursday, right? So uh, yeah, you've got like a week. Yeah, that's right. Well, next Tuesday, next Thursday, Wednesday. It's a week today. That's planning, planning, planning. <laughs> Um, awesome. So I think we are moving into our break. Um, so shall we say, uh, gosh, I had my, I had, had the agenda up a second ago, but should we say five minutes till for break till the next speaker? Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks guys. Thank you. Well done, Suzanne. Thanks, Dan. Very good. How was that? Yeah, it was good. Yeah. Thanks. I, I, well, I was going to write a book myself last year, but it's it's more like the elephant in the room at the moment than the than the elephant getting eaten. But we'll see. Well, there you go. So I've given you a way to eat the elephant, then. Come on. Thank you. <laughs> and you've got it recorded as well. Look at that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how is everybody? Should we say hello to a few people if they've still got the cameras on? See who's here. I want to say hello to Isaac. Isaac. Yes. Isaac is yeah. my mate. Hello, oh, Isaac. Okay. Thanks for coming. <laughs> uh, Isaac, so Isaac, you're not uh, not in Toastmasters? I am not, no. Uh, oh, okay. But I was invited along. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you should maybe think about joining. It's a possibility. Suzanne is uh, nodding away. <laughs> I'll leave it with Suzanne. <laughs> uh, who else have we got? So let that, if we can just say where, where you are in the world and... And which which Toastmaster club you're in? Sorry, not you, Isaac. Although, where are you in the world? I didn't ask you. Uh, London. London. Okay. So, uh, yeah, just other people who've got the cameras on. Uh, so, who have we got? Mary, Mary Lou. Mary Lou. Where are you? What's your Toastmasters club called? If you're in one. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Mary Lou Wong Chong, Brunswick County Toastmasters Club in North Carolina, Brunswick County, North Carolina. Greetings to everybody. It's great to be here and uh, very informative thank you susan thank you thank you and you i've been to your club you meet on a, a tuesday they meet on a tuesday put your link in the in the chat if if you'd like uh who have we got next uh, d d i know you but i can't defilia <laughs> yes hi thank you for the invitation my name is defilia i'm now in mexico city um, my club is Avanzados Evolución. Thank you. And I know, I know from meeting you in Mexico the other day, you're competing in the district final of the international speech contest this weekend. District final. Yes, this Saturday at 7 p.m. <laughs> yeah. So if you've got the link for that, put it in, and we'll we'll bring over a few supporters. But what 7 p.m. on? 7 p.m. here in Mexico. So that would be, I think, 1 a.m. for you. Yeah, probably. Okay, well, me and Amanda will be there. <laughs> <laughs> Amanda, you can say hello. Hi, Dan. I'm from Epsom Speakers uh, with Dan and also Sutton Speakeasy. And then I'm also in a couple of overseas clubs, online clubs in Oregon, Roseburg Speakers and Spoken Word in Calgary. And I, I really enjoyed Suzanne's presentation. I'm definitely going to write that book. Thank you. Bill, Bill, nice to see you here. Hello, Dan. Hello, everyone. Greetings from Brazil. And we have one more person from Brazil, Edith. She's also here. And I got to know Dan last week. I'm from. City Brazil English Toastmasters. Oh, and there's Patricia from our club as well. She's just, she's also. So Brazil is in the house. Brazil is in the house and Dan's gonna give a speech at our club next Thursday. Now I'll be Toastmaster. So come on in to, come on down to Brazil. It's a balmy 30 degrees. Come on out, come on down, we'll go to the beach. We'll go to the beach. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. I'm not sure telling them that I'm going to give a speech next Thursday is going to help grow the numbers any, but still, thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, Patricia, then. Hello. We're just we're just introducing ourselves, saying hello. Hi, hello. Uh, thanks for the invitation. And thanks, Suzanne, for your speech. I've just checked on internet on Amazon your book. Oh, yeah. We and should... I found it. I will buy. <laughs> <laughs> 
Have you put the link in the chat, Suzanne? Now you need to give Good us idea. And Patricia, uh, Dan, it's from our city, city bank, yeah, city club, also in Brazil, city Brazil, in yeah. São Paulo, city Brazil, São Paulo, Brazil, Toastmaster club, yeah. Great, nice to have you. See you next Thursday then. Uh, oh, Joseph, who I think thinks very close to becoming our newest member at Society Speakers. Hello. Hi, Dan. Thanks for inviting me along, and thank you, Suzanne. Really, really good speech. Though I, I don't think I'm quite ready yet to write a book. Uh, um, but yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, no, I'm from London, as I think you're asking for location. Yeah, yeah. Great, thank you. I'll hopefully see you next week at the club meeting as well. Hopefully, yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, Diane? Diane Guzman? Diana, sorry, Diana. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, hello, my name is Diana Guzman and I'm from Mexico City. And now thanks to the uh, pandemic and that we are connected online, I'm a dual member. I'm a member of Mexican English Toastmasters and also I'm a member of Good for Green Speakers in London. And last week we had a great opportunity to have Dan as our guest speaker in the Mexican English Toastmaster Club. And that's why I get the invitation. So thank you again, Dan, for, for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. OK, I think we're probably about ready to start again. So I'll, I'll pass us back to Nish. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm, I've only just become a member of Toastmasters uh, Society Speakers about three or four months ago. And I'm still baffled by how many people that we have joining from all over the world. Um, I think it's pretty cool that you, you've got people from Brazil and North Carolina and everything, um, Hawaii. Um, so I'm very excited to announce our next speaker who's coming from California. Um, so Vicky was a stage and television actress in the Philippines. Um, and she's currently a corporate trainer and personality development coach for adults and teens in the Middle East. Um, today, we're getting um, some of her thoughts and insights into the importance of characterization in a speech. And it, I'm told that it's going to be very interactive. So please, everyone be ready to participate. I'm a big believer in cameras on, um, but, you know, I'm sure that you'll, uh, you'll pick on other people as well. So but if you if you do would like to participate, throw your cameras on and get involved and handing over to to Vicky. Thank you, Nish. Can everybody hear me? You can give me a thumbs up if everyone can hear me. Great. I was a stage and television actress in the Philippines, and I used to read scripts, get into the character, memorize my lines, and go with the narrative under the director's prompts. As a public speaker and trainer, I had to start from zero. I had to create the story and come up with the characters. We all know that delivering a speech or a presentation, no matter what it is, including a technical presentation, is telling a story. And what are the elements of a story? The characters, the setting, the plot, the conflict, and the resolution. When you're narrating a story, you have to make the characters alive. And these essential elements keep the story running smoothly and allow the action to develop in a logical way that the listener can follow. It was challenging for me in one of the Pathways project when I had to deliver a speech on understand vocal variety. I had to create four voices, the mother, the daughter, the caregiver, and the narrator. I had a sore throat right after that. Oh my God. In pathways, you're asked to choose an elective, connect with storytelling, effective body language, and of course, understand vocal variety. You want to produce a bestseller. You have a good content. You have a message that's well-crafted. How do you keep the audience attention? Who are the characters? Have you ever evaluated somebody's speech and it had two or three characters? 
the speaker used the same voice for the child, the mother, and the grandma. Of course, the evaluator in his or her mind would say, holy S, no vocal variety. It's so boring. Of course, our club mission is to provide a positive environment. The evaluator says, oh, your storytelling skills was good. I might have missed the distinction among the mom, daughter, and grandma. I think I wasn't hearing my, I wasn't wearing my hearing aid. Next time, please use different voices so I would know who is saying what and under his or her breath, for God's sake. The first step is to create your script. That is, create your speech. Come up with the characters if it's a storytelling and then the characterization. It's a gentle unfolding of a woman's confidence or a man's brilliant mind or vice versa. We see this in plays, novels, TV shows, movies, poems, and any other format that involves the creation of a character. Of course, examples of a characterization comes forth in a character's thoughts, words, deeds, appearance, and more. So when you're creating a story, define your characters. You just don't blurt out your speech and say, okay, the grandmother, and this is the mother, and this is the daughter. You have to create in your mind the characterization. Now, let me share with you my, my screen and show you what I actually mean. I There you go. Yeah. Can everyone see it? Not yet. Yes. So what we're trying to do is do the characterization and make sure that you identify, understand, and reproduce the distinguishing verbal and physical characteristics or mannerisms, separating one character from another. Now we're going to do a, an exercise, you know, when every time I do my workshops, everybody has to get involved. Describe the character. There are three dialogues here. Let's start with the first dialogue. Dolly, please, want Dolly, please, Dolly. Okay, so keep the character in mind, start describing that character, and then say the words. Give the dialogue, just that. Let me start with Nish. Nish, I've been looking at you and you've been there, you know, um, really effectively listening. So. Let's start with you. Lights, camera, action. Okay. Dolly, please. Want Dolly, please. Dolly. Well done. Everybody give her a big round of applause. So when you were, before you wanted to say this, right, the lines, what was in your mind? How could you describe this, this whoever that was? Um, it was clearly a child. In my mind, it was a child. So I was trying to work out how old the child was and what they were feeling whilst they were saying this sentence. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Nish. Good job. Now, let's move on to the next line. Education is important. That's why we want you to go to college. You've lived under our roof for 17 years. You're ready to move on. 
I'd like to call um, Amanda. Amanda, it's your turn. Keep the characterization in your mind and then say the words. Over to you. Thanks, Vicky. Education is important. That's why we want you to go to college. You've lived under our roof for 17 years. You're ready to move on. Amazing. So what was in your mind, Amanda, before you, you said these words? I was thinking of my stepfather and he was a disciplinarian. He and Suzanne would have got on well. So he would shout at me if I didn't uh, reach my potential. If I came home with a, a, perhaps a spelling test when I was younger and I got 18 out of 20, he would say, what was wrong with the last two words? And he couldn't wait for me to go to college. And so he could knuckle down. He, he, yeah. Awesome. So it was easy for you to express yourself using the vocal variety instead of just going straight to saying those words without anything in mind, without any description in your mind. So that's great. Now, I'd like to call on someone from Brazil. Anyone from Brazil, male? Um, Bill, are you from Brazil? You're right, right. You're from Brazil, yes. right? So well, can you, here then. <laughs> fantastic. So can you um, say these words? Um, the, the last one, si senora, and uh, just go for it. Over yes. to you. Thank you very much. Si senora, that scarf is for sale. For 50 pesos, it's yours. I wove it myself. It'll keep you warm during your American winters. Amazing. Good job, Bill. <laughs> now, I thought maybe you should have uh, made the accent stronger. So now, can you make uh, the accent stronger? Uh, Over to you. OK. Si, senora. Si, senora. That scarf is for mm -hmm. sale. For 50 pesos. It's yours. I wove it myself. It will keep you warm during your American winters. Woo, that's it. Thank you, Bill. Awesome. That, that's, that's wonderful. So I think all of you now can buy for the best actor or best actress. After this, <laughs> one of my favorite uh, and reveal important information to the listener. So for example, when Bill talked about 50 pesos, then you start thinking, oh, OK, she's his either you know, from South America or from Spain. And keep likes and dislikes. Accents can reveal where character comes from. Keywords and phrases can reveal a character's educational background and age. Now let's move on to another favorite part where this is what you call improvisation. How many of you have heard of improvisation? Raise your hands. Okay, so let's do some of that. What is improvisation? There you go. Oh, it's not just goodbye. It's improvisation. It is the activity of making or doing something not planned beforehand using whatever can be found. Improvisation in the performing arts is a very spontaneous performance without specific or scripted preparation. And this is something I, I really like doing because in this, in this way you, you have the freedom to actually express yourself instead of being conscious, oh, you know, I'm not supposed to do this because this is a requirement or I'm not going to do that. What will people say? When I was doing another project in Pathways, it's called Managing a Difficult Audience. I had to use improvisation. Let me tell you why. I had a very tough evaluator and her role was to plan 
for making sure that I have enough hecklers from the audience. Of course, this was online. And they just had to disturb me as much as possible while I am there focusing on my presentation. So what happened was I almost forgot about it and I was delivering my speech and all of a sudden somebody said, hey, can you just stop playing with your phone and look at Vicky? And I said, oh my God, they're fighting. And then I came to realize these were my hecklers. And I still went on with my speech I started asking some questions and I said that, oh, if you would like to ask some questions, you can do that after the presentation. Or I was, I was dealing with whoever was fighting and I would say, if you don't mind, you can turn off your video if you wanna answer your phone. And then don't worry, while your video is turned off, I'm going to ask you some questions. So I did that and apparently, this speech or presentation was successful. This is what you call improvisation. It is now used in companies or corporations. They hire people who belong to the improv organizations. And this is very good for team building skills, negotiations and conflict resolutions. I've taken a couple of courses here in California California, and it's really, really so interesting. One premise or one principle of improvisation is supporting your partner. So yes, and instead of yes, but. I think in Toastmasters organization, this should also be used so that we don't turn into conflicts or maybe some people will instead of us supporting them, we always have that but. And that but, but matters more than the yes. So we are going to, I'm going to ask for two volunteers and use the yes and, okay? Nora, would you want to be a volunteer? I'm actually volunteer, yeah, I'm, you're being voluntold. Laura, Laura, yes, Laura and Dan, Dan, okay. So remember, use the principle, yes, and. You have both just won a billion pounds from the lottery. And both of you are planning to do something about the one million pound that you're supposed to spend in 48 hours. Okay, so who starts? Who wants to start? Dan, would you like to start? Okay, go ahead. Floor is yours. Well, Laura, so we've just won th this, this one million pounds and we've got to spend it in the next 48 hours. Now, the problem is I know that you're in Hawaii at the moment and you're not going to be able to spend pounds over there. So I, I'm thinking maybe I spend it for the both of us, just to save all that exchange rate nonsense. What, what do you think, Laura? Yes, and that is why you're so generous, Dan, with your time and your efforts. And that's very gracious of you to want to take all of the money and spend it yourself to relieve me of that burden. However, because you're always so generous, I think in this case, I should be the one to do it. Let you off the hook. Okay, so Dan, what's your reply? Yes, yes. And in that case, what I'll do is I'll, I'll arrange for the, the funds to be transferred, half of the funds, of course, into your bank account. If you could just provide me with the details, the, your account numbers and, and things like that. And, and I will make, I will arrange, as you said, I, I'm very kind with my time. I, I don't mind doing it. I will make sure that these funds get to you, Laura. You can, you can trust me. Amazing. Yes. And both of you are selfish. <laughs> okay. Now let's move on to the next scenario. I'll go on. on Delphia, Delphia, once upon a time you were the taco something, right? 
you had the name yeah. taco something on, on <laughs> yeah this, uh, i was so interested we'll talk about your taco name later on so the delphilia and who else who else mustafa mustafa okay let's go yeah all right um, so, so what yeah. One, I'll give you the scenario. Yeah. One of you, Delphilia, was actually, she got an inheritance from a homeless man. She used to help this homeless man. She used to give food to him almost every day. And all of a sudden, this homeless man died. And he had two million pounds in his bank account. So now Delphilia is discussing it with Mustafa. What will she do? with the money. All right, over to you, Delphia. So I start, okay. So Mustafa, you know the situation that happened and I'm really sad, but actually I don't know what to do with that amount of money. So what do you think? I know you're a very smart person and what do you think I should do with that money? Uh, Delphia, yes, and uh... Uh, I can see the um, problem that is uh, in front of you and, and me. Uh, so we need to put our heads together to see how wisely we could spend a, a substantial amount of money, though it's not one billion pounds. Um, I would think that uh, we should uh, spend it again on homeless projects widely in the area, uh, trying to deal deal with that problem, its causes and its remedies. All right, Delphilia. Delphilia, yeah. what you, what will you say to that? Okay, I agree, and I think and, we can start. Yes, and yes, and, and. yes, and yeah. we can start this week, maybe we can find um i don't know an organization or of homeless and probably uh we use the money to help them yes and we need a good planner and who else to approach than suzanne poon to help us plan this <laughs> <laughs> good job thank you very much mustafa and delphilia <laughs> Now, I think you, you know more or less the principle behind yeah. improvisation. Display your emotions and, the, and, and showing it, especially when we are here on online Zoom, can be a challenge. When you're this far and you're letting the audience know that you're so sad, I don't think I could be able to see your emotion. Remember, our champion, Mike, car he would go to the screen and express his emotion yeah. and this is something that we should all think about because i guess we will have to get used to online meetings for the next six months or so and i would like to start with using emotional roller coaster where you say one word goodbye and I could prompt you, say goodbye, you're happy, say goodbye when you're frustrated, say goodbye when you're sad, say goodbye when you're angry. So are you all ready? So I don't see anyone else in the... Uh, Dad, we were just saying that those who didn't want to volunteer had switched off their video. And I think they readily did that. So anyone who's interested to join in, please switch on your video. Yeah. Yes, come on, let's get some videos back on. <laughs> yes, let's get some videos. Um, unless probably, yeah. Okay, Suzanne. Suzanne I, I want to, to uh, give you a prompt on an emotion. And all you have to say is goodbye. Don't say anything else. Okay? So probably there were times you were frustrated. So frustrated. 
with your book project. So, the floor is yours. Goodbye! <laughs> wow! That is so sad. Amazing! That was a sign of uh, frustration, isn't it? Yeah. Now, Stella, Stella, I, I, no, we've been talking about winning the lottery, and I hope we all do. You're so happy that you won the lottery for one million pounds, and all you have to say is goodbye. Over to you, Stella. Bye. Okay, Stella. Wow. <laughs> is, is that being happy already, huh? Maybe you should bring it an, a notch higher. You're happy. You, you won the lottery for two million pounds. Can I say something? Yes. Uh, can I say I'm not happy about winning oh, it? Happy because you won the two million pounds. Happy. Oh, okay. That's, that's acceptable. <laughs> I like that. That's so. That's so impro. All right. <laughs> no, no. Okay. Thank you so much, Stella, for that. Let's move on to the last exercise. Okay. I'm going to read it to you, and you're going to do impro. There is going to be again the two of you, an old man. Remember the characterization, okay? An old man is missing his dead wife and opens up to a friend. So this old man and his friend will be doing a conversation. It's an improv with characterization. Okay. Since I only see you guys, right? So I think Bill also switch off his uh, video. Okay. Doesn't have to be an old man, can be an old woman. Laura, are you in for it again? Laura and Delphilia. Laura is the old woman and Delphilia is the friend that she's talking to. She misses her dead relative and she's opening up to Delphilia. So let's do the improv with the characterization. Over to you. Lights, camera, action. I am in shock. And it's hard for me to even speak right now. I just want the world to go away because the heaviness in my heart is too much to bear. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I can feel your, your, I can see your feelings and I understand. Uh, yeah, actually I don't understand this situation because I haven't been in that situation. But yeah, I think you have many options and even though it is a difficult situation, you, you can always find a way to, to continue in your life. And, there's always a bad moment, but then it's gonna be something better in your life. So Laura, were you happy with, with the answer of Delphilia? Did you did you, you know, were, did you um, expect this? I was. Kind of I, I love that she said um, that she actually doesn't know how I feel. Um, having experienced profound grief myself. Um, the worst thing that I that I heard was like I know how you feel from everyone because I it's a very lonely feeling to feel grief mm -hmm. for someone you've lost I think and you kind of just want people to show up and just be there and listen to you um, and not really give you advice you know just to be there I would say um, anyway so I was trying to kind of come from that place for me of like shock you know because it's I think that's what it is I think it's it's very important. Uh, aside from improv, we were also using the concept of validation when it comes to um, validating Laura's feelings. Well done to both of you. And now 
a machine of emotion. Someone asked me, Vicky, I'm a usual happy guy. And I don't, I don't know whether I could be able to express my emotions when I'm delivering a speech that is sad. So there is one exercise that is done. Take one emotion, anger, then take a sheet of paper and write down the situation that what makes you angry. For example, noisy neighbors, strict parents, a lot of homework, wrong haircut, and write it down. Connect all these emotions, and then on this image, you can have the machine of anger, the machine of frustration, the machine of happiness. Do the same things with all these kinds of emotions, and these images will help you quickly get the desired emotion when you want to express yourself. The success formula will be your own creation. Record your speeches, do a separate audio recording, and see for yourself what you can improve on. Get several mentors to help you with your speech or presentation. At the end of the day, it's your choice on how to deliver it. Your characterization and improvisation skills will bring you to the next level in public speaking, including vocal variety, virtual movement, facial expression, and emotion especially. There is always room for improvement. Be bold, be daring. Let's incorporate characterization and improvisation in storytelling and in your presentations. Bring your skills to a higher level. Mind you, this is not about acting. This is about public speaking and enhancing your skills. Thank you, Daniel and Mish for arranging this and thanks to the team of Society Speakers. Thank you to the audience who went out of their way to welcome me and participate. Happy Thanksgiving to those celebrating, including myself. Be safe, everyone. If there are any questions, let me know. Awesome. That was so fun, Vicky. Um, I've got a question. Um, what, uh, how long was your acting, your TV acting career? And when did you, when did you get involved in that? And how did you, how did you transition from that to what you're doing now? I was involved in acting since I was 16 years old. Don't ask me how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> but I was in high school and I was always the president of the dramatics club. And I had this passion for, for acting. And so I did enjoy it. It was, it was something I really enjoyed. And it was a, such a big change for me when I went into public speaking because it was it was a different, I had to mellow down, I had to control my actions, not to be over dramatic, right? But please try it out, you know, improve and, and just break the barrier because that will make a difference, especially if you're joining speech contests or international speech contests. If you've noticed the winners like Mike Carr, Linda, they've used, they've used you know, showing their emotions, showing their movements and facial expression. It's very important. Let's go beyond what we can do. Did I answer your question, Ish? Yeah, yeah, no, you did. Thank you. Suzanne, did you have a question? Dan, do you have a question? You unmuted yourself before me. Me? Yeah, but no, go on. Go, go, go. All right, thanks. Um, so, I'm curious how you strike the balance between characterization and storytelling in a public in a public speech because like that kind of dramatic element is really like it is very engaging but it also can veer very quickly over the top so I'm just how do you gauge the balance of it yeah that's a very good question because sometimes I feel that some speakers are as you said over the top and it doesn't really impress me so all you have to do is to just Feel it and look at yourself, you know, record yourself. When you're doing your action, I, I always record myself and I say, oh, okay, that's over the top. Oh, no, no, I don't like this action. So I try to, you know, push it back 
And always make sure that you perform before you do your presentations to other, to your audience, perform in front of people you know, and they can always give comments. It's always good to ask for advice from other people when you're doing, you, you might think that you're doing the best presentation, but, but when others say, oh no, Suzanne, you, can have, you could have done this, or you could have done that, then it, it becomes something like, oh yeah, why didn't I think of that before? And I always do audio recording as well, whether I'm you know, being expressive without anyone seeing me, am I being expressive? with my presentation. It's very important. So, so like, for example, you might record yourself on Zoom and then use both the video and the audio function that you get. Because yes. when you record a Zoom meeting, you get both sets of files. OK, that's interesting. Yes, yes, it's very important. Yeah. And right. I love it because I'm getting results. And sometimes, especially when you're doing video, is the color of my clothes going with a virtual? It, everything counts, right? Your physical presence and, and the background and whatever, you know, people will always also judge you when you're, you're wearing something that is not too bright, red, you know, and then you, you come out and you're talking about something very serious and you're, you're talking probably about, about how death in the family is being taken and you wear red. So it doesn't really, it doesn't really, you know, <laughs> match whatever you're trying to present. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So um, thanks, Amanda. Great way to get us to show our emotions, to have our authentic selves express ourselves. It's very important. Yeah, especially because now, as I said, we are so much into online meetings. We have no choice but to show our emotions, and we say, "I'm so angry," or oh, "I'm just so glad to see you guys." Right? Or when you want to say. You know, I want to tell you a secret. I want to share something with you. You can you can play with with the how do you say with the camera and and show you know we're all frustrated because we're not going on stage, we're not being physically present. But we have to make the most of what we have. So let's let's try to use the zoom in, in our movements, facial expression, emotion all of that so any other question yeah vicky there's a few in the chat here so edith um i don't know whether you want to would you like to ask your question edith montero okay i'll ask it for you um what is the main difference vicky between acting and delivering a speech with emotions sorry what is the main difference between acting and delivering delivering a speech with emotions? The acting is you are dependent on a script, right? So you have to read the script, read the script, and act it out. In public speaking, that's the big difference. You want to act out the emotion. You don't say, "Oh, I'm so sad. Oh, I can't do it." See, in, in, in acting, even in the movies now, everything is subdued. Everything is mellow. Nobody's doing over dramatic, you know, being over dramatic in movies. They won't sell. Nobody will ever listen to that movie actor or actress again. However, in, in the emotion, you want to say, fellow Toastmasters, today is such a sad day. You don't have to be saying, oh, fellow Toastmasters, <laughs> Today is a sad day. I think I'll slap that speaker. I'm sorry, I'm going to hit that speaker. So there has to be balance, as Suzanne says. There has to be balance. There has to be subtlety. But at the same time, it should be effective. Right. Very good question. Thank you so much. Another great question. I'll let Dephelia De ask it uh, because I'd like to know the answer to this question. Go for it, Dephelia. Thank you. So, yes, uh, yeah. the, the question is, if you're characterizing a conversation between two people in a speech, you look directly to the camera or is just a conversation between two or how, how do you handle this? When I'm doing a conversation with, uh, with somebody, I make sure I still look at the camera, right? 
uh, um, over on TV and the news and all that, people will always tell you, make sure that you also address the audience in the, you know, you, make sure you're also addressing the audience, right? So when you're speaking, it doesn't mean that, yeah, you know, Federico, whatever, and yes, I really believe that this should happen to our lives. So it makes a difference, right? It means that you're addressing the audience as well. That's very important. Thank you. Wonderful question. Can I ask one? Oh, sure, absolutely. You must have go for it. Yeah, okay. Uh, Vicky, great uh, workshop. The exercise was superb. We got the test of improve <laughs> and, and also combining improve and characterization. That's really uh, uh, a great synthesis. Uh, and th my question is about, uh, uh, you, you're giving a speech, you, you have prepared yourself, you've written your outline, you have, you have a script, um, but then you want to include improvisation element into it. Do you pick that up from the situation when you are giving the speech and then go with that? Or, or how do you, how do you inc incorporate improvisation with your, with your prepared speech, if you like? Well, there are two ways because in, in the club that I am in, and that's, you're also a member. Yes, I'm there. there I, I, is, I, we have the Toastmaster of the Day who's called the Improv Master. And the, the Toastmaster of the Day gives an, a prompt so, for example, one of our members was talking about his experience in Russia, where he found snow and he found bear. And all of a sudden, I was the improv master at that time. And I said, hey, Michael, you're not supposed to talk about Russia. You were supposed to talk about the time when you were st stuck in the airport of Bangkok, yeah. in Bangkok. So all of a sudden, and then he says, oh, yeah, I couldn't forget that day when when the, you know, I was stuck, they didn't want me to, you know, to get out of the, of, of the, the airport and I had to stay there. So that's one way. Another way is, for example, what happened to me when I was doing a training way back in the Philippines? Nobody was laughing at my jokes, right? And these were my fellow men. It was so strange. And so I, I said, okay, there was this air con um, AC guy, the maintenance, who kept coming in and out because I think there was something wrong with the AC, so he was trying to fix it. And then all of a sudden I said, would you like to join us? I think you've been coming in and out, so you might as well join us. And then everybody laughed. I, I really didn't find it funny, but they found it funny, so that broke the ice. So it's, it's improvising because when you're doing training and if everybody's not laughing, when you're trying to crack a joke, there must be something wrong. It so happened that I noticed that the Filipino community, they have a different type of joke, yeah. okay? I've been out of the Philippines for so long. I've been in the Middle East and the US, and so probably my, my mindset was, was somewhere else. It, it wasn't with my Filipino people. So, so that is a very important improvisation. Yeah, hope I answered your question. Yes, yes, thank you. Vicky, I have a question for you. Yes, Stella. So, Often, um, and I'm talking for myself here, we've written a speech and I rehearse it and rehearse it until I know it. By the time I get to that stage, I often find that I've lost the emotion. It's no longer natural. Because what I'm actually doing is I am reciting the speech rather than engaging with the audience. Any, any tips on what we do about that or what I do about that? Stella, I re remember when you want to think of a characterization, when you're going into that emotion, think of something that triggered you to create that emotion. Think of that short story in your mind. So when, when you're delivering a speech and then you say, oh yeah, I remember my mom at this point. Yeah, I should have said sorry to my mom. And then the emotion is triggered. Have those bits of pieces of cheap, how do you call it? The cheat sheet, where you have some things in your mind that could create your emotion. And, and think about that. And believe me, it will really bring emotions. Write them down. You know, I have a journal which makes me write down what makes me angry, what makes me frustrated. And if I can't give that emotion, I think of those things. And then it comes out naturally. I'll try Wonderful. that. 
Yes, thank you, Stella. Wonderful question. I love the question. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, thank you for all your questions. And thank you so much, Vicky. It was a great session. I'm sure everyone um, enjoyed all the improv and watching us all kind of uh, make fools of ourselves on a, on a Wednesday, after, Wednesday evening or a Wednesday morning for you, Laura. I think, um, cool. So we're going to go to a five minute break before um, Laura's speech, um, the final the final workshop this evening. Um, so, yeah, five minute break, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Nish. Thank you, Vicky. That was brilliant. Thank you. Most welcome. It's my pleasure. Anytime. I was actually going to, I had a little question, Vicky, which we can do. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. We just, it, it's interesting, uh, really good fun to do the improvisation thing. And it's not something we do really at Toastmasters. And I know you referred to it when you were speaking to Mustafa, your club, which does do that. And I just thought maybe you could just speak for a minute about how you do that yeah. in a meeting and whether we can do right. yours. It's, it's an advanced club. So a lot of them, 16 out of the 21 members are DTMs. And you know, when you're a DTM and you've done so many years of toast mastery, you want to look for something more challenging. And we are offering this. So what we do is even in the general evaluation, and I'm going to invite you, Dan, and whoever wants to attend, most welcome. We did one scenario where the general evaluator was a prosecutor. And then the evaluators were the lawyers. So the prosecutor, the general evaluator says, Dan McGill, you have been accused of no vocal variety, nobody gestures, and you didn't fulfill your speech objectives. Now your evaluator comes and says, your honor, this is a wrong accusation. I believe that Dan, one, two, three, okay, that's the right, the positive things. And I would like to call on a witness. The witness comes and even, you know, fortifies whatever the lawyer is saying. So we are trying to make this in our, within the parameters of Toastmasters for a change. And this is what we call improvisation because we never know what's going to happen. Nothing is planned. We, 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 we like, uh, we have a meeting a week before just to say, okay, so your character, what do you plan to be? Okay, at the time we became a Dracula. And then he would say, ha ha, if you're going to be in my green zone, and if you're going to be in my yellow zone, if you're going to be in my red zone, I'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but this is something that people look forward to because at the same time, yeah, okay, we're working within the parameters of Toastmasters. But for me, I've been there for 22 years. Amanda and I were just discussing it. We can predict already what will happen. In those two hours, we can predict, especially if we know the people well. We know already how he's going to speak. We know already how the evaluator is going to evaluate, blah, blah, blah. So we want to make it different and, and we're, we're, you know, we're having fun. Yeah, thank you for that question, Dan. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, it sounds good. I'd like to come to another one. And, and yes. Yeah. Yes. We, we... You remember the peanut butter? <laughs> oh, yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dan was given a prompt about peanut butter. And he had to just create it with, with somebody else, right? Uh, and uh, with our PQD, Program Quality Director of District 116. And they just went on talking about peanut butter in a dramatic way, in whatever way. And, and they just had to, you know, improvise. So that, that was really funny. You know, the peanut with the butter? You know that? And then my wife hates me because I can't, you know, I keep eating peanut butter or something like that. So they made a story out of that. <laughs> Thank you, Vicky. Yeah, I don't think that's stretching it a little bit, but yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, let's say hello to some other people. Mustafa, where, where are you? I, I mean, I know I know, but where are you from? And... I'm from uh, uh, South London, Croydon area. And uh, I'm a member of Croydon Communicators, and uh, I'm a member of a new member of Improve and a Storytelling Club in Qatar, uh, Doha, and uh, with v Vicky as our president there. And uh, I'm, uh, the, you know, you heard that they have uh, uh, lots of DTMs, the highest con concentration of DTMs anywhere in the world. And I'm very lowly CCCL there trying to catch up with their creativity and uh, all the energy that they, they bring to the meeting. So 
and also I'm the uh, prospective member of uh, uh, your club soon, hopefully. And uh, soon is soon is getting too too long, but uh, but it, it will happen hopefully. And then I, I've also joined the data science uh, club in the because I'm interested in the, how to communicate science uh, to the uh, to the uh, to the general public, if you like. Um, so, so I've I've joined them also, and I did did one speech there. Um, so, um, so it's yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, it's 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 interesting with with the Zoom, you could Zoom anywhere, to be honest. Uh, and uh, uh, but it's it's just a time factor. How do you, uh, that's the question for Susan Poole. How do you plan to do too many things in limited time? So, so that's uh, that's the that's the challenge, really. Uh, Thank yeah. you. That's it. Thanks, Mustafa. Yeah, we'll. Yeah, we're still holding our breath on you joining our club, but it yeah, sounds yeah, like yeah. you've got plenty at the moment. So. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Elisa. Elisa, I know you visited us a few times lately, but uh, tell us where you're from. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Good afternoon to everyone. Good evening to everyone. Uh, I'm currently residing in Puerto Rico here in the Caribbean, and I'm part of Puerto Rico Toastmasters Club. But I am so thankful to have had the opportunity to go around, visit different clubs. Uh, Laura, I heard your speech at the Hawaii contest. Uh, that was really, really awesome. So congratulations. <laughs> I actually did visit Mexico a few days ago as well. And I think I recognize some of you from that meeting. So it's just so cool to have the opportunity to, to be all together in this place, learning and growing together, reaching for our goals, reaching for the stars. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Elisa. Great, thank you. Are we, are we good to go, Nish? Are we? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Cool, so our last speaker, we uh, are traveling this time to Hawaii. It's um, 10, 40, I think, in the over there. So we're joined by Laura Reed. Laura is the founder of Storyforth, which supports entrepreneurs, business owners, and nonprofits through the use of effective storytelling. So it's a great little follow on from what we've just learned from Vicky in terms of uh, characterization. Um, it's been a great flow actually from uh, planning planning some a large project characterization and now through uh, to the actual um, manifestation of through storytelling, which is coming on to Laura. So here with her workshop on how to rock your virtual reality, I am saying a big aloha to Laura Reed over in Hawaii, please hands together guys. Thank you. Thank you guys. Let me get all my ducks in a row here. All right, everyone see my, my slide here? Thumbs up? Okay, good. When I was a little girl, I literally had no voice. It was hard for me to even speak my name. I know in Toastmasters, we talk about finding your voice as a metaphor. But for me, it's been a very literal journey. Um, I'm wearing my name necklace today, it says Laura on it, to remind me, I used to wear this necklace on purpose because if someone was to come up to me even 10 years ago and ask me my name, out of all the words in the English language, for some reason, my own name was hardest for me to say. So sometimes I'd have to point to my necklace. I grew up with a severe stutter. It was so severe that it took years of speech therapy for me to be able to just speak fluently, maybe one sentence even. That led, to me, led me to have a lot of social anxiety and a deep humiliation and embarrassment when I would stutter in front of people. Finding my voice for me happened when I began to tell stories. I began to learn strategies to break out of my comfort zone, but remain comfortable. 
And when I started doing that and started to see that it wasn't so much about me and my story anymore it became bigger than me because I realized eventually that I could inspire other people through my story. For me, that was the real game changer and made it worth it. And then the more and more I got out there and spoke, the more fluent I was able to eventually become and to be able to be here with you today. The title that I love best uh, for myself, my son actually <laughs> gave me, he's 16 and someone had asked him like, what does your mom even do? <laughs> and he replied that I am a storyteller something whatever. And so I really love to um, embrace that title because it's got a lot of clarity in it actually. Uh, it was such a beautiful day and beautiful view on the day that I departed Hawaii. These are the Hawaiian islands below me from my airplane window. It happened to be my birthday and it was 2020 this year. I was flying to Bali, Indonesia uh, for my first opportunity as an actual keynote speaker. And I remember thinking to myself, this is going to be the best year ever. I was finally achieving my goals. And like, what could possibly go wrong? Well, <laughs> um, a, lot, a lot went wrong. Um, a lot is still going wrong. And I never would have guessed in a million years that I would end up actually being stranded in Indonesia, away from my son, away from my husband, my family, my home here in Hawaii for four months. 123 days, uh, every flight kept being canceled, I could not make it home. And I had already um, been a contestant in the international, the Toastmasters International Speech Contest for the first time. So I had made it to like the next round and I was due to fly back home and compete in Oahu. Instead, I found myself in the middle of a rice field and everything had switched to virtual. And I still had to give that speech. And all these conferences I was going to speak at, only one of them I was able to speak at live in early March before every, everything switched to this virtual reality. So for me, it was very much um, a learning curve because storytelling is important to me. Connecting with an audience is important to me. And even on that level to overcome my stutter, and be able to not be as nervous. My strategies for that were often making eye contact with the audience and just feeling the energy in that room. All of that was taken from me. Um, so everything that I'll share with you today, I've really lived through myself. It's been a lot of failures and relearning things. Uh, but when it comes down to it, my biggest fear and yes, some of these speeches that I gave, even the international speech contest, oh my gosh, like it was three in the morning for me when I gave that speech with a time difference. And um, that morning, for some reason, we had this like crazy bug invasion and there were just biting ants everywhere. And there had been an earthquake and the volcano, Mount Agung was on high alert to erupt. And so Wi-Fi was really sketchy. There were like, I had so many um, obstacles to break through. But what I really feared was this virtual void, like the feeling that there's people there, but sometimes my brain is tricking me and are they really there? Or am I just a crazy person standing in my room speaking to no one? I was missing that actual engagement and that energy. And for me, that was the scariest thing. But I'd love to know from you, if you can just write in the chat, even in one word, what is your biggest fear about speaking virtually or the biggest obstacle that you face or something you just really want to learn from my talk today? You can just put it in one word in the chat. I've got my chat up, so I'm going to see it. And let me scroll down here. So go ahead and just share that whenever you want. Anybody? Are you guys still awake? 
<laughs> I know it's late. And you can just put it for everybody. Here we go. Okay, they're all showing up now. Um, the fear that no one is listening. Oh my gosh, yes. Speaking without an audience, losing connection, tone. Interesting. Thank you so much for sharing that fear, being able to read the audience. Exactly. All right. I'm going to start out with practical tips because I think on a practical level, as much as I love kind of a deeper spiritual level and storytelling, if we don't have the practical things set up, it distracts from that important connection that we really want to engage people with. Someone had mentioned before, yeah, we're all looking at each other's and like peeking into their homes and judging, right? And it's true, we get this kind of window into everyone's lives, whether they have a virtual background or a real one. And the number one thing to remember is that everything tells a story. And there are different ways to tell a story. It's not just verbal, right? There are all kinds of um, other ways, you know, like a picture tells a thousand words, right? So think about setting your stage. And I think as Vicki had alluded to as well, like your background is telling a story. So what story do you want to tell? How you're showing up is also telling a story. And how you're, you're viewed is telling a story too. So with the basic just lights, camera, action, I'd like to focus on that first because lighting, as any photographer knows, is so important. Um, you'll see I'm backlit right now. This is, um, you know, we back to all these banana trees here and everybody's got that one kind of nice section of their house they sometimes set up. And this is really kind of the only, our house is under construction. So for me, this was a nice clear background, but without a light on my face, I'm gonna turn this off right now. Um, that's not gonna be very effective. <laughs> And I don't want to tell you guys to go out and buy anything, but basically work with what you have, right? I invested in, it's not very expensive, but a, a ring light on Amazon that I, I'm using right now. And that is um, just on a tripod. But when I was in Indonesia, stuck there, and I was giving a speech and it was dark because it was three in the morning and I didn't have a lot of control, I just rounded up all the lamps in the house. And if you have a lamp, pointed at your face, that can really help as well. Your body language, gestures, your appearance, your eye contact, again, it's all telling a story. And in the uh, old days, I guess I can say now, um, before 2020, before at least March 2020, we used to be able to have these literal stages and be able to move around. And I believe we still have that. What I've really tried to ask myself is how can we make the most with what we have, with this virtual square that we are given? And I think, yes, the winners of the International Speech Contest, Dan Carr, he really used that. The trick is now though, he's already done some things like that. And I think to be effective now, you have to come up with some original novel ways but there are standard things that really work. Moving from side to side a lot, I find it can be a little distracting now where that used to be something effective we could do. And if you're moving too quickly with your body or your gestures, things can tend to blur. What I find is to start out really planted where you are and then to make a point, and Vicki was doing this earlier too, leaning in, remembering that everyone exists right beyond that magical lens on your laptop, on your computer, or your phone. And so leaning in can be a very effective way, especially when you're trying to make a point, get a little closer to everyone. Because in some ways, this is really to our advantage, especially when we're giving a speech with a story everyone can see our faces like quite clearly and we can lean in to make that crucial eye contact. Now, someone had brought up um, 
having that emotional engagement when we're doing the improvisation and acting. One tip that I think really helps is to remember to try as much as possible to look into that lens. And it takes a lot of trust and faith that everyone's still with you because we can't look at everyone anymore. I can't even see all your faces right now. People have literally, you know, turned off their videos sometimes, right? We can't control that. But there are things that are in our control. And one is that. And one way to remind yourself and to remind yourself to try to have that crucial emotional connection is to put a little photograph right by that lens. And that's going to remind you to look there. When I was in the speech contest, I pasted a little photo of my son and it really just got my heart, right? But it reminded me that the important thing about my speech, the most important thing is to try to have a connection and that emotional engagement with people. And that really helped me a lot. And using this in the most creative way that you can, having an element of surprise. We used to not really be able to have that unless maybe we hid something behind the podium. But now we can have all kinds of things that we just bring out out of the blue that no one might suspect. Um, I had the, the pleasure um, and maybe the pain of competing um, with Dan in the recent for a speech festival, right? And uh, which was super, super fun. And for a part of my speech, I was telling, my, um, telling a little bit about my um, unusual childhood, growing up in a very redneck family, drinking Budweiser at a pretty young age, because it was just always in our fridge. And at the end of my speech, I had hidden a can of Budweiser and I, I opened it up at the end. Um, so that was something no one really expected. It was an element of surprise. Right, um, but you guys can steal that now because I've, I've already done that. Not that you'd want to, <laughs> but you can come up with your own ways, things that tie into your story and use this to your advantage as a prop. Remaining relaxed and engaged. For me, this has been the biggest challenge that I've really had, especially with being relaxed and not being nervous. Um, quickly, if you can just put in the chat, like what are you, what makes you most nervous about speaking virtually? Go ahead and write that in there. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's a lot of the technology I'm worried about and things kind of going wrong or being a little glitchy is something that always brings up my anxiety. So one thing, yeah, internet connection, right? Oh, people who don't understand my jokes, yeah. Uh, spilling my Budweiser, <laughs> good one. I was so nervous about that actually. I had no idea how much I was shaking until I picked that can up and lack of eye contact, all right. So one way, and Vicki had brought this up too, is you guys, this really works well. You can open up Zoom, right? Just open up your Zoom app and start a new meeting. And this meeting is going to be just with you. <laughs> and what you can do is just hit the record button and record the meeting. And it's you rehearsing, you rehearsing your speech. And as hard as it is for all of us, because we're our own worst critics, right? As hard as it can be to listen to yourself, watch yourself back, because you're your own worst critic, it is really the most effective. And pay notice to how's my lighting? Like, did that work? Or was it a little too over the top for me to move away and like that, right? Um, listen to your sound as well. Um, the sound is another thing that is just super important, right? People are going to check out if your sound is really garbled and not coming in well. Remaining relaxed, forgetting your speech. Oh, these are some good ones. Um, forgetting the lines. Okay, these are really good to bring to it. Oops, for some reason it's not advancing. Here we go. 
Right. We don't want to lose people's attention, right? That's one of my biggest fears too, is that everybody just is checked out because I'm, I already feel a little checked out standing like right now, I'm literally alone in my bedroom on an island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, <laughs> you know, and it's hard to imagine. I'm actually, actually really am speaking to people from all over the world, which is amazing. Um, but I need to believe and remember that. And here's my number one tip. And <laughs> I'm actually a certified life coach too. And this is gonna sound like the most anti-life coach thing you'll ever hear, but lower the bar, <laughs> right? If we set our goals too high for ourselves, if we say we're going to remember every word and we're going to be perfect and we're going to make everybody laugh and all our jokes are going to land and no one's going to be offended and all those things, then we're setting ourselves up for some failure. But if you set an intention instead to have fun no matter what, right, to be connected in the best way that you can to make the most with what you have, then that is going to build up your confidence and you're going to have more success because of that. So set intentions that are really achievable, kind of like Suzanne was sharing with us too, right? Bit by bit. Right, building up your confidence with speaking this way is really important and working with what you have. You know, another um, practical tip I have is just standing up if you're giving a speech that's at least five minutes or longer. Um, when we stand, our breath tends to be a little bit better. We're in control more with our gestures. Um, and I know we've all gotten like super lazy, right? Quarantined at home, but standing, um, at least for me, it really helps. I actually feel less exhausted, more energized if I'm standing. Um, but that means raising up your screen. And yes, there's a lot of fancy stuff out there right now that you can buy. But like for the contest I was just in with Dan, I actually had my laptop boosted up on boxes, you know, and it was like a little precarious, but I made sure it was going to work. And again, it's just no one's going to see any of that. So you can work with what you have. As far as forgetting your speech, um, nowadays too, you could have... Um, big flip chart paper. I mean, for all you know, I've got a teleprompter, I've got all, you know, no one's going to know that whatever is beyond your screen now. So there are ways that you can have some crutches, I think, where we couldn't have those before. Can you imagine if you did, you brought in your flip chart paper and had it up on the wall at a live event, right? So there are ways that I think now we, you can take advantage of that. How do you feel when you're in your comfort zone? Give me a little answer there. One word answer. How do you feel when you are in your comfort zone? Just write it in the chat. Relaxed, relaxed, yes. Focused, fantastic, authentic, comfortable. <laughs> As a lifelong introvert, for me, my comfort zone is definitely where I love to be. You know, like nothing more than being on my couch, turning on Netflix, not having to talk to any people whatsoever. Oh, carefree was another answer. There's a reason we feel that way. When our brains are relaxed, it makes us feel like we can be ourselves, like we're not going to be judged, right? We can just be, um, be in that really calm, focused place. And scientifically, that's exactly how we're feeling, how our brains are. And the relaxed brain is much more able to remember, right? Remember your lines, um, speak from a place that's coming from your true voice. So why do we wanna break out of our comfort zones if we can really be ourselves when we're in them? For me, the key, and of course, it's all over social media and you can't really, you know, go a week without someone saying, you got to break out of your comfort zone. I even brought it up in my speech this morning. And I believe that we can still achieve our goals and do scary things because courage is not the absence of fear. It's not, um, we can never overcome all of our fears because some things are scary. 
speaking in front of people will always be a little scary. It's the, one of the number one fears, worse than death itself, worse than spiders and heights and things that can actually hurt us, right? But instead, we can do those scary things anyway, but bring some of those intentions and feelings from our comfort zone with us. So for me, instead of setting an intention that I am going to be confident, I'm going to be my best Oprah Winfrey, Tony Robbins self, I'm just gonna knock it on the park, right? Um, and fake it till I make it, my least favorite expression ever, by the way. Instead, I can set an intention to be calm, to be peaceful, to be relaxed. And that's it, that is going to be, if I achieve that, that's going to be success for me. And that changed everything. When I started showing up for my speeches with that, like I'm just going to be calm. Out of that came more authenticity and more flexibility for myself with my words. Grant yourself a wish. I used to say all the time, like, I, I'm not funny, right? It's really hard for me to be funny. It's hard for me to speak in front of people. It's, it's hard for me to remember the whole speech. I need my notes. Instead, I switched my language to say, it's easy for me. And I wrote it down. It's easy for me to speak calmly in front of people. It's easy for me to say yes to speaking invitations. It's easy for me to be funny. And those words, like our, we listen to ourselves and changing the words for yourself, granting yourself those wishes that you want. It's easy for me to write a thousand words a day. I think or 2000, that might be my new one. Thank you, Suzanne. You begin to believe it and you begin to live it and come from that place of more abundance in your life than a place of scarcity when we're saying, I can't, I'm not, I don't. Your storytelling, it's still the most effective, powerful way that we can engage with other people. And I believe that it is needed now more than ever. If you are not using storytelling in every speech, it doesn't matter what it's about. It doesn't have to be the whole speech. It can be an anecdote. But if you're not using it, now is the time to really embrace stories. Because when we're sharing a story, it's generating empathy, relatability, and that is fostering more compassion. And that compassion creates more tolerance, more acceptance. Isn't that something we need? Especially when we're at this platform now where we can speak to people all over the world. What a gift that is. What a gift that we should receive in the best possible way and then share it again with others. So I encourage all of you to share those stories. And as Vicki was sharing too, you know, you can, um, you can build in those characters. And she said, sometimes people can be over the top, like, but experiment with that, right? Experiment and see if, you know, see what's sounding authentic for you. And if it's not being true to yourself, then you need to question that a little bit. But I find sometimes too that you can be a little extra now, right? This is a great safe place to be able to experiment and to do that and share those stories. The ones that are, um, you're maybe even a little feel vulnerable about, a little scared to share. We think about vulnerability as something to avoid, right? Because it literally means like we might get hurt. But our vulnerability is our greatest strength. It's where all of our creativity is. So those stories you might be a little scared to share, the ones that might make you cry, tell those stories. 
I'm sorry, I've completely lost track of time because I've, um, I meant to set my timer and of course I forgot to do that. So if someone could just let me know, um, Dan, how much more time do I have? Uh, I think I think you should have finished about fifteen minutes ago, but don't. <laughs> no, I think I think we're fairly close, but you're fine for. for, okay. for the last <laughs> minutes, so just, people can go when they're when they're bored. So carry on. I don't think. Okay, anybody... thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, see, he is funny. So I was so I mean, it was so fun to compete with Dan. He's hilarious as I'm sure all you guys know and Dan actually took the audience first place um, win in the speech contest that we were in um, and I took first place for the first time in the big international you know kind of kind of way um, for the judges uh, the judges vote but those judges you know judges judge right so <laughs> um, but that was really fun to do and again, it was storytelling, I think, that you know, Dan and I both, both did. What I want to leave you guys with is that the world might be chaotic all around us. And there's so much that is out of our control, but there's a lot that is in our control. And I believe that we can spread ourselves a little bit wider and try to kind of do more and more and try to force an outcome that we want, or see this as an opportunity for us all to go deeper. Because many of us are stuck at home with maybe a little bit more time on our hands. This can be the time to write that book, right? Eat that elephant bit by bit. Start really crafting the, your most powerful speeches that you know are going to connect. So I encourage all of you to go deeper. That's where that stillness is. And those beautiful stories are going to come from. And share from that place. That's where our stars are and our stardust. Thank you guys so much for having me today, giving me this opportunity. Awesome, thank you, Laura. Can I open the floor to two questions? Suzanne? Thanks, Laura. That was really amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I, I wanted to ask a technical question in relation to looking at the camera, because one of the things that I find is that I, particularly when people have got their cameras on, I like to look at the audience, but then people can't see that I'm looking at them because I'm not looking in the lens. So do you recommend looking in the lens rather than looking like with Zoom, like looking at the faces? I think you just need to be really conscious of it. And yeah, I love that question. This is something I've struggled with. If you're like me, you're kind of checking yourself out too. You can't help it when we see ourselves, right? And, and making sure we still exist in the world, I guess. I don't know what it is. Um, but I think there's times in your speech, if you're really conscious about it, there, there are times when you really want to connect. You're telling that meaningful part of your story that you want to practice looking into the lens. But if you're doing a workshop, I also think, and I'm trying to allow myself a little more flexibility to look in the chat, to look at people's reactions, even though they're all on mute. You can tell when people are laughing when they're kind of nodding their head or just seeing that they're with you. Um, I usually try to recommend that everybody please turn on their video for me. I forgot today, but cause it is nice to get, you know, our social cues are so messed up. Like how messed up are the children gonna be from this generation? Like they haven't learned our social cues, right? Of, of seeing people's smiles and seeing that, that nodding. Um, and we can still have that kind of engagement. So um, I do think it's important to look in the lens when you want to have that connection and impact. Um, and again, recording yourself and watching back, you can see what's happening. Um, I recently gave a speech that I wasn't prepared for. It was only two or three minutes speaking on Zoom. If I could go back in time, I would have I would have prepared more. But I was like, oh, I'm just gonna have my notes and it's okay, I can glance down and look at them, no one's gonna care. But I washed myself back and every time I looked down at my notes, it was, it really disengaged. Like I felt that from myself. It really took away a lot from what I was trying to share. 
And what I like to say is internalize, don't memorize, right? So if it would have probably taken me maybe three readings to have internalized that speech. So I knew the beginning, middle and end of it enough to allow myself flexibility to not look down at my notes. Um, so that would be my advice for that. Sorry, I got a little long-winded. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Anybody else? Did you have yeah. Just uh, very quick. I mean, you said you have a story with every speech, uh, and at least have an anecdote. Um, I um, sometimes I, I struggle to to have one. So, so what do you what do you do with that? Do you do you, do you make it up or what do you do? Wait, you're saying you don't have a story sometimes? Yeah. All right, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I'm going to disagree with you. I know okay. we don't really know each other, but I'm going to say that's not true yeah. because everything can tell a story. There are stories you've already had a story happen to you probably 10 times over today. Yeah, okay. And uh, if you guys follow Ira Glass, he's one of my um, heroes and he does a lot of wonderful workshops. He's, you know, This American Life NPR. And uh, he gives a little workshop on storytelling and he illustrates that the simplest thing can be a story if it's told with the elements you need for storytelling. And all the story was, was about him making toast for breakfast. But you hung on every word. You're waiting for that toast to pop up because he built up stakes and some suspense and, and you know, it seemed really authentic to him. It was funny. So I do believe that any topic can really be a story. Um, and I, you know, I give whole workshops on this, but some basic elements, right, of defining kind of who that hero is in your story, who the villain is, um, and creating some suspense in there, having a strong beginning, middle, and end can tell a story. So even if it's a story where, let's say, um, and you know, you're, you're, I'm not going to guess your age, but I'm going to guess like you've had some stories happen to you in your yeah. life, right? Yeah. Um, it could be about, you know, think about the stories that had an impact on you. Um, honestly, anything could be a story, but I think the most effective stories are the ones where we had an epiphany and idea happened, like it changed the course of our life. Um, maybe you lost someone close to you. Maybe you gained love in your life. Like there's those stories. And if you can take it and relate it to, let's say you're giving a more professional speech, there's still a, a golden thread there that can connect to an authentic anecdote there. Um, and finding how to weave that, right? Once you decide what that single message is that you want to share with your audience, um, you can connect it to a powerful story as well. So I look forward to hearing your story next time. <laughs> yeah. Go for it. Yeah. I've got a question, Laura. Yes. Who would you say it was better to have on your side, the judges or the audience? <laughs> there you go. I've got a question. I've got a proper one. No, that's a great question. Yeah. Oh, you've got another one. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that we did a competition together and we actually, sorry, this isn't particularly related to, to, to what you spoke about, but it is a good story that you've got that I want you to tell. So we did that competition together and we had to do auditions, didn't we, if you remember? Like a oh, God, that's a nightmare, yeah. Yeah, in 5am for me. But you told, us, uh, you told the story in your two minute audition, which related to the, the, you know, when you were stuck in March and you were away from home for a few months. I just thought you could maybe talk about that for a minute because I thought it was so funny and so good. And, and yeah, you I mean, you know the story I mean, where you ended up and, and what was what was happening, if, if you don't Thank mind. You. Yeah, no, absolutely not. Um, and for the record, I think it's better to have the audience on your side than the judges. I really do, because it's the audience that you need to have that love for. Every time you show up to speak for them, it's about them, right? It's not about you. It's about how can you inspire them to maybe do things a little differently, to share their stories, right? And if the audience is with you, like that's what matters. I mean, judges, yeah, they're literally judging and all these different things that might not even matter so much in the real world. And Toastmasters, yeah, we're grammar and counting the ums. And, but in the real world, you know, if you're up on a big international stage, not in front of Toastmaster people, um, really good speakers make mistakes, right? They're a little more authentic. They might not be as, you know, come off as polished. I don't know if you've ever heard someone speak and they're almost too polished. And then it's, 
it's not as authentic um, and you might not be laughing and enjoying it as much. So that's my two cents on there. So congratulations, Dan. Um, and then, yeah, my story, it was um, that I told this was, okay, here's a scary table topics thing. <laughs> so Dan and I had an audition and um, my friend Kane, who was one of the judges, I think for it, he, he had told me that, oh, don't worry about it. Just two minutes, just show up and do this audition. It's going to be really informal. So I, I didn't really, I wasn't really prepared. I thought it was going to be so different than it was, but instead we're putting one of those dreaded like breakout Zoom rooms, Dan and I and the other contestants. And then one by one, they called us into this like mystery room and little by little they're left with, you know, I think we were like some of the last two people left and it was so scary. And we didn't know what the question was for the audition. They asked us like one question and it was tell us something funny that's happened to you in the last three months, right? Um, and then we had to speak off the cuff about that. And for me, it's humor has been a survival mechanism in my life because I grew up in a kind of um, like unusual family with um, a lot of a lot of obstacles for me to overcome. And if I didn't have humor, I probably wouldn't even be here right now at all. I would not have survived it. Um, so how I approach things that are um, that are hard for me is through humor. So I immediately thought of being stuck in Indonesia, and out of that came um, two. Serbian brothers, both named Vladimir, who were the directors of that conference. And we ended up all being um, quarantined together in yeah, the middle of this rice field, cobra infested. You know, there's no snakes here at all in Hawaii. So, you know, I was, I was terrified. And the day one, we had a snake in our kitchen, I remember. Um, but I was stuck with these, yeah, these giant Serbian men. And of course, they're my family now, you know, so out of, but if I didn't have that humor, because um, I, I was, I was grieving for my family, my, especially my son, uh, then I would not have survived that. But out of that, there was a lot of transformation. So those kind of moments, um, um, Mustafa, right, where, um, I mean, I wouldn't recommend being quarantined in another country with, with two Serbians, but um, I would, um, although I, like I love them, um, but finding those times that were really transformational for you, I think is, is really, really important um, and drawing from that. Thank you. Um. Somebody asked about relaxing in an interview using Zoom. Do I have time to answer that? Or? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. This is interesting. I just did um, a workshop for high school seniors who are doing job interviews, internship um, interviews, and college interviews on Zoom. And, um, and we talked about how to be more relaxed and trying to get that job, right, or get into that college. First of all, it's using all these practical tips, remembering that everything tells a story. But as far as being more relaxed, you know, again, it's like really defining what you're so scared of to begin with, right? And trying to be really specific about that. Kind of like Suzanne was saying about those specifics, it's so important to identify it. Otherwise it's this big, scary, vague monster. We don't even know what we're fighting against, right? Um, but if we say, okay, specifically what am I afraid of? Okay, forgetting my words, not knowing an answer to a question, then we can really dig in. Um, and I find with something like this was their number one concern was not being able to answer a question, knowing that you don't have to put pressure on yourself. You have a choice there. You can be flexible with your answer. We're taught in Toastmasters pausing, right? Pausing like in real life, I find really effective. Like if I'm really mad at my husband and I want to start yelling at him about something, just that pause and knowing I don't have to react. I can have a thoughtful response. I don't even have to say anything. So in Zoom meetings and Zoom interviews, I find knowing that you have that power of a pause. If you don't know the answer to something right away, a pause buys you some time and it feels like a long time to you, but it's really never is. And then you can repeat back the question to buy you a little bit more time, show that you're active listening, right? Because so many of these things with um, interviews on Zoom and meetings, again, take the Take the attention off of yourself and remember that other person, it's really about them. And if you show that you're listening to them, you're being present by your verbal cues again, nodding, 
repeating things back, like, you know, bringing in some active listening skills, then you're going to come over as much more, you know, positive and engaged, which is what they're looking for too. And then of course, having that crucial answer to tell me about yourself, right? Tell me about yourself. That's when your storytelling comes in. So if you can already have, you know, an anecdote or a story crafted that you know is going to be relatable for that specific situation, then that is going to um, be the most effective. That's what we remember, right? From childhood, like we remember those stories we were told when we were little kids. I can't remember yesterday, but I remember that. So, you know, it's, it's really, our DNA is built for stories. So in any situation, that's important. Thank you for that question. Cool. We have one final question from uh, Priya. Priya, do you want to ask a question? Thank you so much, Nish. Hi, Laura. Thanks for the presentation. It was, it was great listening to you. I have one question pertaining to a virtual environment. So I had joined Toastmasters a few years ago, and I had gotten OK in terms of internalizing a speech and giving them without having any notes in hand. But I got back to Toastmasters now, and it's on Zoom environment. And I always write my speeches. So I have my speeches in front of me when I need to deliver them. So I go back to having it in front of me while, when I perform, even if I've practiced it a few times. So how do you circumvent that whole thing? It's like you have the cheat code in front of you. You don't wanna look at it, but you know it's there. And you're scared that if you don't have it open, you're gonna miss something and you're gonna blank out. So how do you circumvent that situation? That's an excellent question. And when I've struggled and lived through my own solutions to a lot, I used to memorize every word because I was so scared of getting stuck and stuttering on a word that I wanted to practice every word. So a word just didn't come up in my mind and suddenly I couldn't literally say it, right? Um, and then I remember I was in the storytelling contest in New York and um, it was like the, you know, the championship stakes were high. It was packed with my friends and families there at a bar up on stage and I memorized. And about halfway through, I forgot the next word. And suddenly I forgot everything, the whole rest. And it was like the room, I'll never forget that feeling. I'm kind of getting like a little nervous talking about it right now, but it was like the, the room melted around me. Like, and to me, it felt like at least seven minutes, it was probably seven seconds, but it was a nightmare. And I said, I would never do that again. And what I've learned after researching a lot of strategies with this, again, it's internalizing, but how do we do that, right? Is writing out your whole speech. Like I do think it's a good way to start is writing it out, crafting it, being connected with it, um, or at least recording it into a microphone and listening to it back and then maybe transcribing it from that. Um, so your words sound really natural, but then practice it enough so you know it, but then trust yourself to take those words of your speech and look for those um, kind of like those road signs through your speech, right? The billboards that are pointing you to what comes next in that part of the speech or story. And just memorize those words, like just that, maybe that first sentence, you know, or just the first couple of words are gonna trigger in your mind what comes next. Because in any speech, there's a natural flow to it. There's a story arc, whether you're telling a story or not, there's gonna be a beginning, middle, and end to your speech. Um, and then you know when you hit that, it's like, oh, like I know what comes next. And then it takes a lot of, of trust in yourself. And I've done it both ways, even recently. You know, when I tried a teleprompter app, I've done, because I wasn't trusting myself. And even if you mess up, you're going to learn from that, but you're going to come off more authentic if you're not reading from notes. Um, when I'm in my Toastmaster club um, here in, in Waimea, they, uh, when I have someone, you know, when one of our, um, one of our members re starts just reading a speech and it's obvious and they're actually just looking down the whole time, I almost like, I kind of check out, you know, I don't know if you feel that way, but I just feel like, oh, like oh, yeah. I'm checking out, like I might turn off my video even and go get some coffee, you know, but if someone starts out and they're, I can see they're, they are looking in that lens. They're speaking to me. I'm going to be much more engaged. And isn't that what we want? You know, otherwise, why bother? Why bother communicating with each other? You know, if we can't come from a more authentic place and share our real stories, anyone can get up and read a paper, you know, it's, um, and it's not taking away from the work you put into the speech, but if you can step it up a notch, trust yourself, 
all that work you already put into it, creating it. You know, that's like the most important part, sharing it. And then we kind of wimp out, right? So, you know, trust yourself with that. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're yeah. welcome. Okay. Thanks, guys. Okay, guys. Thank you, Laura. What a great, um, a great, uh, lovely, authentic speech. Uh, well, workshop. I loved all the, uh, I loved all the, uh, all the advice you gave. And uh, thank you as well to uh, Vicky and Suzanne. Um, I think everyone here who's who's left uh, has probably got plenty of tips that we can take away from from this uh, from this from this evening. Thank you very much. Um, for joining us, I'll hand back over to Dan to make his final remarks. Thank you, Nish. Round of applause for Nish, please. Well, really, really took us through it well. Thank you. It was excellent. And if anyone's still here and still at the system, put your camera on for a minute just while we finish off and we can give a round of applause to the speakers. So firstly, Suzanne, great job. Thank you. And Vicky, we'll, we'll be at your club on Sunday. Thank you, Vicky. And finally, excellent job. Thank you, Laura. So they, they were really, really good fun tonight. They, they've all been good, but I, I don't know, I particularly enjoyed tonight. I think I did one the last time, so that was probably why I preferred tonight, but it was nice to just sit and enjoy them. We'll try and probably do another one in January and, and get, get another few people, maybe, maybe one of our members and, and a couple of other people from, from wherever. But yeah, our next regular club meeting is next Wednesday. If anyone would like to come to that, you can find us, Society Speakers, on Facebook. And, and if you've signed up on Eventbrite, you'll have the details there too. So it would be good to see you for that. I think Suzanne's given another speech next Wednesday. Yeah. Uh, and, and we've been, maybe we might get Dephelia giving us her international speech next Wednesday, which she's given at District this weekend. So that'd be nice if she can come and do that for us. Uh, yeah, so we'll see you next Wednesday. Thank you again to all the speakers. And there will be a video of this, which I will send out. So if you signed up on Eventbrite, you'll get the link to that. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Hi, Vicky. See you soon. Bye. See you. Yeah, I'll see you Friday night. <laughs>